brain study because as you study you are growing your brain so not only am I preventing things like Alzheimer's and dementia in my life because I'm using my mind I'm growing my brain I'm using my mind to grow my brain but I'm educating myself I'm learning about the things of God you don't have to study what I'm studying you'll study your thing but are you using your brain so tonight and tomorrow I'm going to challenge you to do two major things the first is grow your brain Okay, use your mind to grow your brain. So in order to use your mind to grow your brain, you need to understand that your mind and your brain are separate. They are not the same thing. People generally think when you talk about brain science, you're talking about the mind, but you're not because they're totally different things. Different substances, different functions, different realities. Okay, so that's the, one of the first things that I'm going to be teaching you. And if your mind is separate from your brain and different to your brain, we're going to learn about the science behind that, the quantum some quantum quantum physics, we're going to learn some amazing techniques, we're going to learn a whole bunch of stuff that's going to help you to realize that your mind and your brain are phenomenal, but your brain can do absolutely nothing without your mind. Okay, so the mind is the power where the power resides. So when God talks in the scriptures about you have a love power and a sound mind, that is very true. He didn't say love power and sound brain. He said, love, power, and sound mind. You have the mind of Christ. So when we make that distinction, we shift our worldview. And our worldview shifts from one of being a materialistic worldview, which is very dominated by an atheistic point of view, to one of a Christian point of view, a philosophical, theologically correct Christian point of view when we look at the mind as dominating the brain. So we'll do a little bit of philosophy as well. We'll do a little bit of all kinds of stuff. Now, before you think this sounds too difficult and I can't slip out the door without a scene because I can see who's ever slipping out the door now, <laughs> remember you're made in God's image. Okay, and, we, and a lot of atheists say, well, what does that mean? People like Dawkins who leads the pack of the, what they call the new atheists. What does it mean to be made in God's image? Well, what it means to be made in God's image is actually we don't know. Because God is so huge and so incredibly big that we've got to be careful we don't put God in a box. And that we don't recognize his magnificence and his eternal glory. So when you look at things like science, you start seeing that. So to be made in God's image is something that we don't understand. But he sent us Jesus. So he made himself accessible, but God's not limited to Jesus. He's expressed through Jesus. So that was a way that we could relate to him. So it gives us a hint of our being in his image. So Jesus is a really great way of seeing what it means to be in God's image. So therefore we should be basing our lives on the attitudes that Jesus manifested while he was on this earth. So when God tells us we have a love, power, and a sound mind through the wisdom of the word, the wisdom of the word of God, and that wisdom is expressed through the living person of Jesus Christ, who as we know is, is God, okay, or, the, or a form of God that we can relate to, then we are going to be modeling our mind action after Jesus. So we have the exact model for how to use our mind and how to renew our mind in the Bible. We have absolutely no excuse to have great minds. And we also have been given a love power and a sound mind. So let me stress what that means. We have been given love, power and soundness as our default not a spirit of fear not unsoundness not lovelessness okay so love power and sound is very interesting that that's what God has given us so if you've never seen me teach before you'll notice I've got green trees and I've got a little wiry looking tree over here so this over here represents the love zone so this side of the stage is the love zone you're all in the right zone this side of the stage is the this is the fear zone. No, I'm just joking. It's limited to this up here, okay? So this side of the stage is fear, and that is love. L perfect love casts out fear, as the scriptures say. So and love cannot coexist with fear, we see in science. So science is God's expression, or like he gave us Jesus to un start to try and understand what God is. He gives us science to understand the world he's given us. So science actually means, it comes from the word scura, S-C-E-R-A, which means to gain knowledge. Okay, it means knowledge. So when we talk about science, we're not just talking about brain science or physics or quantum physics. We are talking about history and biology and geography and engineering and botany and 
every single thing that you can think of that's knowledge based which is the entire world how the computer works to how you how you build a building all of that is knowledge okay so we are designed in a world of knowledge based after the ultimate source of knowledge so that also gives us an idea of what it means to be made in his image it means that he has given us knowledge and we are supposed to be evolving in developing and learning his knowledge so when I used to work in schools I've done 25 years of work as well in education and I and I still have a lot of educational influence in terms of products and teachers that I train and so on what I always say to used to say to students when I work with them directly is that when you are studying for your exam and, I, and this goes across the board, it doesn't matter what your age is, because we actually are all students all the time. But when you're studying to show yourself approved, that's not just in terms of your emotional life or your Christian life. It is in terms of mastering the knowledge of the world that God has given us. So when you do well at school, you're worshipping God. I put forward to you that gaining knowledge about the world that God has given us is a form of honoring and worshipping God because you're taking the time to understand what he has given us so therefore being made in his image makes you very intellectual and in fact being intellectual is very spiritual because God is the source of intellect and he's the spirit of God so therefore intellectualism is spiritual so if you abuse intellectualism, you step into the fear zone and you have an, a form of intellectualism that is incorrect. Whereas if you're in this zone, you have the form of intellectualism that is correct. Now this is our default mode. We are made in his image and all those things, all, the, all that that means, and we've only just touched on a few concepts around his image. But we are also, if God is love and he's the source of love and God is good and God is perfect, therefore our design is one of perfection and we see this clearly in scripture and science just to quote one scripture and there's many it says in Ecclesiastes 729 he made us virtuous if you track back what the word virtuous means right back to the Greek etc you will find out that it means perfect so we at the scripture says we are made virtuous we are made he made us virtuous he made us perfect but we choose to go down our own pathway yeah. so inherent in that scripture is another very profound and important concept and that is one of free will mm -hmm. choice now we all go on about free will and we all like it and we all think it's a great thing and but then we start acting like we absolutely have no free will how because we start listening to people telling us well it's in your genes so therefore you have no control it's a disease therefore you're a broken machine therefore you need medicine to fix you and I'm not against medicine I'm against mind medicine I'm not against medicine that keeps you alive and surgery etc etc I'm talking about when we take when we're going through life's troubles which is going to happen that we start taking medication to numb that that's not the answer to life okay so we need to recognize when God says bring all thoughts into captivity you are supposed to use your intellect to bring thoughts into captivity and not just the ones you feel like bringing into captivity all thoughts which means that it's a continuous process of constantly talking to God so we are supposed to bring all thoughts into captivity to Christ Jesus not medicate all thoughts into captivity Okay, so this, this requires a new way of looking at how we are going to do life in a very materialistic world that tells you that you can blame everything, everything in your body physically for how you are, everything including your mother for not breastfeeding you for long enough, whatever. You can blame anything. We are trained literally in an atheistic world not to take responsibility. We are told that we are biological automatons so, and we are told that free will is an illusion and that philosophy in that worldview which is called materialism has been around for many years but very dominant for the last 350 and it's incredibly fashionable in the scientific world to talk about illu the illusion of free will even Einstein unfortunately said that free will is an, is an illusion and he's one of the greatest scientists of the 20th century if not of all time alongside Newton and a few other people 
So what we have to understand is that we as Christians, if we don't gain knowledge, if we don't use our love power and our sound mind to step into our love zone and choose correctly and choose to think correctly, we can very easily become atheistic Christians. We can easily live our life in the fear zone, which is the abnormal zone, which is not the default mode of how we function. And what is an atheistic Christian? Someone who comes to church on Sunday or someone who does their Bible study in the mornings and someone who professes to believe in God and really does believe in God and Jesus and the resurrection and, and the word of God and loves the word of God. But when they actually do life, there's a complete disconnect. So there's one life which is spiritual and there's another life which is I'm in life and it's tough and I'm stressed and it's difficult and it's all this kind of stuff and we start getting led by a materialistic way of handling these things and we look to the wrong sources for information and what we need to do is learn to freak out in the love zone that's the name of a book that I'm writing at the moment how to freak out in the love zone how to pray continuously is the subtitle so in other words how to pray continuously is a vitally important part of you being made in his image using your perfect design to choose to go down the correct pathway and that is something you are in control of you see when God made us he made us able to choose. So he did something that I don't know if any of you thought about. And that is, the, uh, he actually voluntarily restricted the way that he functions in your world. Why? Because he gave you free will. You see, if you're a robot, without any ability to choose, you're then just running on automatum, which then does not answer the question of evil and suffering. You see, people, atheists, what's one of the first things that Hutchin, people like um, Christopher Hutchinson and, and Hitch, sorry, Hitchens, I can never say his last name, Daw Dawkins, and all these new atheists, what they will say is explain evil and suffering. And they say that if your God created everything, that, and if he's omniscient, he created evil. But what they haven't understood is that God gave us free will, because God is good and he's incapable of creating evil. But what he gave us is a Genesis ability. God is directly involved in the world. He's not a mechanistic God who wound up the earth and kind of set it on its path and now he's lying back there in his hammock and watching us mess up. He's not that kind of God. He is an interactive God in a way that we are going to kind of start seeing through science tonight and tomorrow. But an interactive God requires, as an interactive God, he requires that we choose to allow him to guide us. And if we don't, don't he loves us so much that he says I have made you able to make your own decisions so when you choose to follow him it's a choice that you make God comes into your world when you invite him so the invitation for us to enter his world is there all the time as you know revelations explains it so well when he's knocking on the door what we need to recognize however is he's knocking on the door so there's an invitation from him and an invitation from us we choose to let him in, which means that we actually choose to then step into the love zone and live our life in the love zone and freak out when we need to in the love zone. And we'll talk about some examples of that. We'll probably get there by tomorrow night about making choices in more depth. But for tonight, I want us to start understanding this concept of the love and the fear zone and the ability that we have to choose and how God knows everything but he voluntarily restricts his involvement in your choices so therefore he provides ingredients as opposed to the baked cake you see he provides the ingredients of success and they are provided because God is beyond space and time he created the space time dimension that Einstein discovered he obviously created everything God is the source of everything we all know that and scientists spend years and many many hours discussing where is the where did everything start from well God is the source of everything and God can take as many years as he wants and in, in many how he wants to do we don't even know quite how he did everything what and so we mustn't presume to know it and that's where I have a big issue 
issue with Christians and non-Christians when we presume that we know exactly how this whole earth came into being. And that is very dangerous and that is why I love quantum physics, which is God's science obviously, which shows us that there's so much uncertainty in how things happen. So there's a certainty in that we know God is the source of everything, but how he actually did it, we have indications in a metaphorical way in the word of God, but we don't have a direct etc, etc, this happened first, that happened second, and we can't limit God to, for example, six days in Genesis because we don't really understand what that means. And that's putting God in a box. Why would we put God in a box? We don't know if it was six days, six million years, 3.8 billion years, like the earth is why couldn't God have created the earth 13.8 billion years ago and then decided at some point in that time to make man in his image we don't know we really don't so we must be very careful about presuming to put God in a box because then we limit him and we limit our interaction with him so by having free will what we also recognize is that therefore the ev the possibility of evil exists because God is good and God created us in his image, but introducing the concept of a human being able to choose means they can choose wrong. If you look at scripture, we have a love power and a sound mind. We have power. We have Genesis power. We have birthing power. We have the ability to make stuff happen. We have the ability to create matter out of our mind. And this has been proven scientifically that as man is the pinnacle of his creation, so we see in quantum physics and we see in the physics and we see in mathematics, we see that a human being with the ability to choose, with consciousness, with the ability to think and direct our, our, our attention and our intentions, we actually create stuff. And this is what I'm going to show you tonight. Right now as you're listening to me, you are in Genesis moments. You are giving birth to new baby nerve cells. You are turning my words into physical structures in your brain. You are taking mind stuff because I'm speaking words. You are hearing a sound wave. You have got electromagnetic waves delivering the images that you see on the screen and the light, etc. around us. And these are entering into your brain. And your brain is a substrate through which things are transformed, like your body is like a radio, it transforms this, these signals that God has given us into things. So my words are these signals that you are hearing. You are hearing sound waves. It's a sound wave and the reason you can hear me is because the sound waves move through, it's a physical wave, so it moves through the air, literally squashing the oxygen. And it hits your eardrum and your eardrum starts to vibrate in conjunction with my voice. It starts to resonate. And as it starts to resonate at certain frequencies, so the signal passes into your brain and it sets your mind into action. We now have a signal in your brain and you, you with your mind start, you are now analyzing, you are now thinking, feeling and making choices about the information that I am giving you. And as you think and feel, that represents the activity that we see in a human brain. And we're going to see some brains and this kind of activity that I'm talking about in the images that I'm going to show you tonight and tomorrow night. So as you think, you generate activity in your brain. That is your mind in action working through the physical substrate of your brain. So you direct your mind. So you decide what's in your mind. You have the ability to have trash in your mind and good stuff in your mind. You have the ability because God said it. I made them virtuous but they choose to go down their own pathway. So we do like the illusion, I mean, the, the concept of free will, and it's not an illusion, but we don't always like the consequences of free will, so there we like, therefore we like to blame. And that's where tremendous conflict comes in and we start operating like atheistic Christians, making excuses for our bad choices. So every time we think and feel, it automatically leads to, to a choice. So thinking, feeling, and choosing are the three components or the three actions that form the action of the mind. So you think, you feel, 
and you make a choice and you think feel make a choice and you think feel make a choice and it is happening at 400 billion actions per second on a non-conscious level and it's then fires up at 40 times a second still on a non-conscious level and eventually pops into your conscious mind around about six every six every six to ten seconds so every minute you have six more or less peaks of consciousness where you're aware of what is going on around you. You may not have known those numbers, but now you do. Now you don't have to sit there thinking, oops, where I am, first six, second, first ten seconds. <laughs> you might just become non-functional if you do that. So what we have to do is have this knowledge and then be more aware of our awareness. We have to be more deliberately and intentionally aware of our consciousness in our minds. What is going on in our consciousness and more importantly, what is going on in our non-conscious? Because our non-conscious mind, so therefore I've just said that our mind has a conscious portion and a non-conscious portion. So your love power and your sound mind has a conscious and a non-conscious portion. So your conscious mind is small and tiny and your non-conscious mind is huge and part of your spiritual nature. And what we understand is that this is basically the spiritual nature of man, the non-physical. So when the Bible talks about the non-physical, sorry, the spiritual realm, the equivalent in science is the non-physical realm. And what we understand about the non-physical realm in science currently is that it's the biggest part. It's somewhere between 95 to 99% of everything. And it's where your memories are stored. It's where the action is happening. It's where the majority of stuff is going on in the world that we don't really perceive, but without it, we wouldn't function. And then we have these conscious moments, which is only at 1% to 5% of how we function. And how we, the non-conscious drives the conscious, but the conscious is where we receive information. So you're consciously receiving information, but your non-conscious is helping you understand what I'm saying. Saying. So therefore your non-conscious is filled with your memories that you have been building creatively since you were conceived. Since in the womb you were starting to build memories. So therefore the memories that are dynamic and organic and evolving constantly, they're not ever in one state. They are always changing. They are always getting more. Every time you think of something that you haven't thought about for a while, it changes slightly because you have new experience. And every experience adds to this vast memory store that becomes your belief system and becomes you. How you function, how you see the world is based very much on what you have built in to your non-conscious mind. So we build through our conscious mind and then we pack it into the non-conscious mind. But the non-conscious mind is involved in the building process as well because it's doing a lot of the quantum and mathematical and, and biological and molecular quantum biology stuff that we don't see going on. So there's all the stuff that's keeping you alive that's on a non-conscious level. There's all these, so there's different levels of things that are happening on the non-conscious level just in you alone and then in the world. So it's a little bit like an iceberg. So the tip of the iceberg we can see, but under the water, you know living out here, that under the water the iceberg has no end or beginning. We just don't know where it ends. It's just huge. And it's got this nature of growth that just seems to constantly be developing and growing from one end. And that is the nature of the non-conscious world and the non-conscious part of you, which is the spiritual world. So science shows us that there are 11 dimensions. They think there could be more. There are at least 11. We are only aware of four. So the fact that you can see each other here tonight and see this building is because your brain is perceiving four dimensions. And what are those? Length, breadth, height, and time. And those are the four dimensions of space-time that Einstein discovered with his general theory of relativity. And what he discovered, which has taken science to a whole new level, is that we perceive that, but that's what we consciously perceive. But on a non-conscious level, we have these, these universes that are not anything weird or new agey. Please, the new ages, where do you think they got the stuff from? God. They just deny God. So don't get scared. It's not woo-woo. Someone sent us an email that saying, isn't this stuff woo-woo? I said, really, woo-woo? I mean, we, 
How do you think the who made it? Why do we why don't we give God credit? He made these things. Do you think God's limited to four dimensions? Do you think he's limited to 11? I think he's limited probably infinite. We don't even understand that. But science is God is revealing in these end times the stuff that he locked up as it said in Daniel. He's revealing to us as we are growing and evolving as his human beings. He's teaching us more and more and more wondrous ways because what well, it's right back in the in the ancient days of democracies he had an idea of how the world functioned and then we pass through history with great men and minds and each time we have a new development and then we get to people like Newton who radicalized one of the greatest scientists of all time who gave who helped us to understand the laws of gravity but Einstein a strong believer in God said that he doesn't understand gravity his laws don't tell us what gravity is his laws tell us how it works so god reveals to scientists and then we think well that's it and then einstein comes along and now new now newton's laws of gravity and newton's all newton's basic laws now lo no longer work that well anymore because we have another new understanding and then we have in the next development the two great biggest developments of the 20th century are newton's newton's um understanding of space time newton's general relativity and 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 special relativity and quantum physics these are giving us incredible insight into these dimensions this non physical the spiritual nature of man when we study science we are studying our spiritual nature We are getting a glimpse of the magnificence of God. So when we see that the that our universe is um 150 billion years across and growing all the time, we start getting an idea of the expansiveness of God and that there's multiple galaxies out there and it's just so huge. We start getting a vision. God starts showing us as the Hubble telescope was discovered and all these discoveries are made and 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 cosmology was born through Einstein and all these incredible things. This is God gifting us with knowledge and ways of understanding his knowledge and as we attempt to understand we don't think oh well science must be there and spiritual no as you study the universe you are studying spirituality you are studying the nature of your king you are studying the nature of god and when you start studying the nature of god your expansiveness changes in terms of your sorry your vision of his expansiveness changes and you start developing an eternal view and you start seeing hey my choices need to start being operate need to start operating from an eternal and expansive way of thinking that i've got to be stopping so small minded and start getting big minded so how do we get big minded how do we renew our minds renewing our minds means that we are getting big minded we are changing we are going to that direction where we naturally lean towards we lean towards that direction you know the second law of thermodynamics is entropy where things go from order to disorder so the natural thing in this world goes from order to disorder we see that as we get older when things just don't seem to be in the right place anymore and you know this skin scales are getting some crinkles and all kinds of stuff we see this thing happening but when you step into this zone the love zone that is reversed You see if you stay in a world that is not being driven by God yes entropy will happen and things are going to you into decay because that's the nature of the physical how God designed it etc but our mind does not decay do you know that our our brain is the only organ in the body that doesn't age it doesn't get old we can destroy it through our choices and make it brain damaged so envy jealousy wrong choices not operating in our lives and using our power incorrectly physically damages the brain we as the pinnacle of, of creation we are making choices and as we are thinking feeling and choosing we are causing genetic expression in our brain and when genetic expression occurs we are taking the knowledge of the world and we are building that into networks in our brain that look like trees so then our thoughts look like trees in the brain and our thoughts represent these they are physical representations of the knowledge that we have gained our experience our belief systems our memories whatever you want to call them okay so we are learning beings we are always learning we are designed to learn and when you learn in this direction you are going to be literally growing going away from 
from the law of entropy because you're going to be building your mind and renewing your mind and building your brain. To give you an example of this, how many of you here have been a bit concerned that you might land up getting something like Alzheimer's? Be honest. Put up your hand. The way that we read the statistics that it's increasing and you see it's millions and every, I mean, it's always coming up and they spend billions trying to work out what it is and they still haven't worked out what it is. Well, there's a few very, very, very profoundly intelligent scientists that have really shown us what this is. But of course, it's not going to be told to the general public because it doesn't make money because you can't give this the cause of the, the real restoration of, of things like Alzheimer's. You can't give it a tablet because the thing for Alzheimer's Alzheimer's is your thought life. It is a thought disorder. Okay, so in other words, if you go through life in the wrong zone, you increase entropy, you increase disorder, you create damage inside of your brain. You are simply following the second law of thermodynamics. You are simply destroying your brain. You are giving yourself brain damage. When you don't follow the laws of God, when you don't follow the model set up by the person of Jesus, uh, the personhood of Jesus, the wisdom of God manifest. So therefore, what we have found from research is that if you choose to think wrong, and I say choose to think wrong with the bitterness, the unforgiveness, the worry, the anxiety, the freaking out in the fear zone, and all the wrong things, not praying, not listening to God, and basically living like an atheistic Christian, just worrying about Alzheimer's will increase your chance of getting Alzheimer's by 63%. Okay, so those of you that put your hands up, retract quick. No longer will you worry about getting Alzheimer's because that is one of those Ecclesiastes 7.29 choices that you should not be making in your life. Because if, God, if we understand what God, how God has made us, it is not natural and normal for you to get Alzheimer's and dementia. And even if it is in your bloodline, you do not have to submit to that. You see, things that are in our bloodline are propensities. Do you know what a propensity is? It means you have the potential to get it. So if it is in your bloodline, you have the potential to get it, but you've got to switch it on because it's actually a dormant potential. That's what a propensity is. It has not yet happened. And it cannot happen on its own. It's not self-emergent. In other words, it can't boom in your life. It can't exp You have to activate it. You have to choose to activate that or destroy. So I would rather destroy any potential for Alzheimer's and dementia in my life. So I do know that if I get my thought life under control and renew my mind and I grow my brain, like I spoke in the beginning, by studying constantly, learning the Word of God, learning about the things of God, you can find I am always, like my, I've always got a video, a lecture playing when I'm getting ready or praying. Or I've always got something where I'm great, developing my mind. I know I am preventing those things going wrong in my life so that I can perform what God has called me to do. Now forget about me, I'm using it as an example, but maybe it's good to use me as an example because it means that I practice what I preach. I do. I practice what I preach. All the things that I have taught you come from my experience, my practice with my clients. We reach millions of people globally. I've written extensively. These are not just things that I have sucked out of the air. These are things that come from years and years of study, experience, working in my own life, working with my patients, working with people, etc., etc. In other words, this stuff is not just something out there that's difficult to do this is based on the Word of God I have been a Christian my entire life I'm blessed to have known God from day one and grown up in a Christian family and restore and, and basically grow into that and grow into the science and the science has expanded my view of God science has really given me another perspective and that is why I make such an effort to teach science in the churches and it's starting a wave of people starting to teach more science in the churches which is really great I get the doctors that I work with to come on TV with me and we do conferences every year where I get, this, get the doctors to, in other words I'm trying to get scientists speaking more about how they function in their world in terms of and how they function in the world as a Christian and what that means and to show people there is no conflict because you see people like Dawkins will say God is dead so just live your life don't worry you can just live your life like you want and he will say things like and the, and the, the new atheists they call the new atheists will say things like you have to choose between spirituality and science how dumb okay because what is really funny about that statement is that those same people say that we do not have the ability to choose so they've chosen to not believe in God but they don't have free will 
I mean, I, I rest my case. It's a stupid argument because they're choosing all the time to argue, to fight, to, and to try and annihilate people that are believers, etc. And they're aggressive with it because they, and they're making, that's a choice. They've chosen. And they've chosen to use their phenomenal intellect. And, and, and Dawkins is a phenomenal intellect. He writes incredibly well. He has, he's really eloquent. He's brilliant. But he's brilliant in the wrong zone. And he's chosen to be that way. In other words, we need to be very careful about what we're doing with our choices. What pathway are you walking down? So I was supposed to have shown you at least 40 slides by now. <laughs> so now let's do a little bit of recapping of what I've said before I teach you some more stuff. And first thing is we've got, we are not only a family, um, I mean, it's, I'm not only a scientist, etc. I have a, fa a four, well, there we go, there we go. We have four kids, and they um, keep us very grounded. Mac and I can't even have an argument anymore because if we do, and my kids will say, you can choose, and you can get brain damage, and, uh, and read this book, and you know, all that kind of stuff. So sometimes you just want a good old fashioned argument, but then when you've tra started training yourself to become very aware of God, you know, when you start becoming aware that six times a minute you're supposed to be talking to God, when you start realizing that the Bible says pray continuously, bring all thoughts, just those two statements alone, bring all thoughts. You are thinking 30 to 60,000 thoughts a day. So I challenge you, are you bringing your 30 to 60,000 thoughts per day to God? Are you bringing them into captivity to Christ Jesus? Because that is praying continuously. That is a lifestyle of worship. Or are you doing it when you're in church where it's nice and convenient and easy because it's easy for us to celebrate God and, and to, you know, just to be perfect in church. And then the minute you get in the car, all just, you know, entropy happens. It all goes to complete chaos. So what are you doing with your thought life? Because if your soul is not well, as the scriptures say, nothing else in your life will be well. Okay, that's a paraphrase of, the, of, of that scripture that I pray that your soul will be well. Okay, so in other words, we have to think what when God tells us to renew our mind, this is a lifestyle. In 2014 to 2015, this, the CDC, which is the Center for Disease Control, they discovered a startling, frightening fact. And that fact was that people are dying quicker than they used to do in previous years. So in other words, the death rate has increased with the advance of medicine and technology. We have such an advance in medicine and technology. Why are we dying younger? Why are the millennials, your 18 to 35 year old, which include Generation X and Y and all these different names, why are they going to die 25 years younger than my generation? Okay, I'm not a millennial, I'm a little older than a millennial. Okay, why? Why is the millennial generation going to die 25 years on average younger? Why is, so is what they are very concerned about is that they picked up this trend between 14 and 15. They then said if we pick up the same trend between 15 and 16, we are in trouble. Globally, we are in trouble. They did pick up that the trend is continuing in a downward way. In other words, people are, for the first time in generations, people are dying when they should be, everyone dies, people are dying younger than they should be and than they have in previous generations. So for years we had an upswing where people were living longer and it increased and improved. But now it hasn't just stabilized, it is actually going backwards. So that's 15 and 16. So 16 and 17 we can predict and it seems like the predictions are in place. It's probably going to be the same situation. So, so we have a major crisis, crisis on our hand and they talk about it being a lifestyle crisis because if they look at the statistics of why people are dying younger, what they're seeing is that the, it's happening, here's, here's the thing, in the wealthy countries more than in the poor countries. Makes no sense, does it? Because the poverty, the poverty um, and the hunger will kill, well that, will, that still will, starvation will still kill you. But if you look on average at a, at, a, at a country that is able to feed itself and you compare it to a wealthy country like America, United States, Britain, Australia, New Zealand, so what you call first world countries, you are going to see that the wealthier the country, the quicker people are dying. 
when they shouldn't be dying. Why? They have access to all kinds of medicine. And there is an, a tremendous abuse of medicine. As I already said, medicine is a tremendous gift from God. It helps with this entropy factor, the fact that our bodies are decaying. So thank goodness God has sent us medicine in, and that we have surgeons and we have doctors that are able to help us to survive. But where we have a situation occurring is an abuse of what has given us. And we also have 50 years ago two new major introductions into our, our lifestyle. So, so 50 years ago more or less in our lifestyle we had two new things. The first one was the industrialized food movement. And the industrialized food movement introduced something that is supposed to be food but it's not food. It is manufactured food. It is God's normal food being abused. It is science that has had a wrong choice applied in that science has been used erroneously to destroy the planet. So we have a huge problem with a food industry, a food where food has been turned into like a factory and where things like monoculture, which is your vast taking, um, just growing one type of crop and growing and um, breeding out other types of crop. So mainly corn, soy and a hybrid version of wheat. And instead of growing in one patch of land, a multiplicity of different things which is the normal way that you would grow things and have your animals all fertilizing the land etc it's called the agroecological method which is the normal way that you should be growing things which keeps the earth healthy and will feed everyone that's been taken away and under the guise of trying to provide more food and what it's done is increased hunger increased um, waste ink and the land is being destroyed and our bodies are being destroyed so that's a very quick summary of us not being stewards of creation. Now God loved what he created. So that means that you have to steward your mind, your brain, your body and the earth that you live in. And it's generational because what we are doing now is creating a, um, is changing the situation that in future we are going to, we are giving our children a terrible inheritance. We have major waste in our lands, etc. because when you have one type of, of crop growing, for example, it destroys the land. You then have to introduce chemicals because all kinds of insects come. So you've got all the chemicals. The chemicals, they don't even know. They don't even know 2% of what the chemicals are doing, what GMO is doing, etc. So we have a bunch of science that is, so the world has become a laboratory for scientific techniques that will produce things that make money. And we and our children and the next generations are being are the, basically the victims of this. So we need to, as Christians, stop thinking, oh, well, I can just pray grace over my food and God will bless it. No, it is a complete reversal. God does not turn organic, it uh, does not turn um, those Twinkies or whatever into organic kale. <laughs> Okay, so if you're buying processed food that is not food, it's a food-like product. And if you feed that to your brain, you are destroying your brain. And you are destroying your body. And this is not a fundamental statement. This is a fact. In fact, I wrote a book, it was, I released it last year, called Think and Eat Yourself Smart. And I will throw in some comments about this as I teach you tonight and tomorrow night. I strongly recommend you get that. There's an online program that goes with it called 63 Days to Think and Eat Yourself Smart, where I teach you from a theological, scientific and philosophical point of view how to understand that you need to eat real food. I don't believe in diets. I believe in eating real food the way God intended. So if you like paleo, go for paleo but make sure it's real food and not stuff out of a box and a packet and things that aren't real. Real is food that's been grown in a natural agroecological way with diversity. So for example we have, we have 15,000 different types of apples. Currently in the stores you will find up to five maybe 12. So in other words, what happened to all the others? We have through our um, um, food-like industrial nation, a uh, food-like um, indus industrial food complex, we have got rid of those because they're not financially viable. So back to the farmers, back to the local farmers, local seasonable, um, lack, uh, organic, um, pe pesticide-free. This is what in real food is. I'm not saying if you want to be a vegan, be a vegan. If you want to go paleo, if you want to go eat meat, you do whatever you feel works for you. But don't eat meat from that concentrated animal feed. 
feeding operation, where those animals live under the most vile conditions, where a creature that God has given us to bless us that plays a massive role, for example, cattle, when they are allowed to roam free on pastures and feed naturally off the land, they keep the grass growing. And the minute you take them off the land and you stick them into the concentrated animal feeding operation, desertification will occur. So we, so they have taken huge tracts of land in my uh, country of birth, Zimbabwe, where they culled the elephants because they thought the elephants were destroying the land, and they took the wild animals off the land, and the, le the land became a desert. And the very scientist who, who was involved in this, this year, years-long project said, hang on, I've made a mistake. Let's put the animals back on the land, and within three months they turned deserts into grasslands. And so when we allow the animals to roam like Jesus, like let's talk about I mean, uh, the agroecological method, farming method that you see in the Old Testament, then we find the land is lush and that there's health. So if we, we have to be being a steward of our mind means you make mind decisions about your food too because your primary need is or your primary addiction is love. No one can live without love. No one can be, every part of us, in fact scientists find that we are, have found that we are wired for love. We have not a chemical, a neurotransmitter, a structure, a quark, a anything in our body and on, in the earth that we live in and all the animals and the plants that is not wired for love. In other words, we are only designed for the positive and to eat the positive. Does that make sense? So there's, if you're eating honey from your local beehives in this area, you are going to be getting stuff for your immune system that you need because you live in Alaska. And the bees are different in Texas and California and all over the world because they are so the plants that they, well, um, that they use to get their, you know, they, when they pollinate and etc, etc, that is going to contain what is needed in the actual honey that you need to live in that land. It's wired for love. So if we mess with the wired for love system in nature and the animals we, and we put that in our body, we mess with our body because our body is simply a physical thing, okay, driven by our mind. And how do you do that? It's men's minds that did this, men and women I'm referring to, whose minds that made the decision to set the industrialized food movement going. And it's minds, our minds, that we decide to listen to the food adverts and buy the junk. Whereas, and to say we're too busy or too expensive, don't even give me those excuses because it is not more expensive. I have done the calculations. If you buy from your local farmers, it is way cheaper. We buy our food from a concentrated, uh, a, a CS, not a con concentrated animal feeding operation, wouldn't go there. I, when we, Mac and I have driven past some of those, I want to get out and go let all those cattle free. And um, uh, Mac wouldn't let me get out the car, I was really upset. Anyway. Um, <laughs> We, we get our food from a CSA, concentrated, uh, I keep saying that, uh, it's, it's basically the CSA is your farmers that get together and you, bas they, and you just buy your, and they give you all the local produce, eggs, meat, etc. And you pick up, we pick up our box on a weekly basis and we get all kinds of diverse foods that have been grown correctly. It is way cheaper than going into the stores and buying things. And also, at, at the average American is spending 17 million, I think it is, on ringtones. You can put those ring that you can't eat ringtones. Stop spending money on ringtones and Halloween costumes and start spending the money on food. This is the one country, the United States of America, spends the least amount of their salaries on food because we've made food cheap, but at what price? It's not cheap. It is taking your health and the land to, uh, to the level of destruction. So in this book, I talk about think and eat yourself smart because research shows that as you are thinking, thinking is 80% of eating. So if you are worked up and anxious and stressed and worried and whatever and you are eating that organic kale, you uh, immediately as you, and, and then I'm talking about eating the good stuff, but if your mind is not in the correct state, your, one of the things that happens in digestion is that your pancreas is going to secrete up to 20 different peptides that are required for, as part of that very intricate digestion process. When you are in any negative toxic state in the fear zone, that they will, those peptides will not be 
secreted correctly and they will not work properly. So you're eating your organic kale when you're grumpy and fighting with your wife, well then it's not doing much good for your body because you don't have all the peptides being secreted. And these are the kinds of things that I teach in this book. I teach admit, quit and beat. There's scriptures, there's signs to show you that you are a royal priesthood, a steward of creation. So act like it. I challenge Christians around the world now to start taking eating seriously. I'm not being a fundamentalist. I'm not saying eat walnuts for your brain. I am saying eat real food. Admit there's a problem. It's not nice to admit, but I've got all the, the proof. I've got pages and pages of references, links to videos you can watch, etc. And then in the second part, I talk about quit it. So in first part, admit there's an issue and understand what it means. What is a CAFO? What is organic food? What is bad about organic food? There's some f organic farms that say that they're organic, but they're using organic herb pesticides. And they, they say that the, the animals are raised on organic feed, but it's corn feed and, it, and they're still locked up. That's not organic. So you want pasture raised. You know, you want things so to, I teach you those things, what's pasteurized versus, you know, what are the traps that we can fall into and how you can, you know, I've given, even given links for the CSA boxes, community supported agriculture, that's what CSA stands for. So that's the first part. The second part, I talk about quitting it. I talk about quitting, why? Because of what it's doing to the land and because of what it's doing to your body. So I talk about thinking and eating. I talk about the non-conscious and the conscious mind. I talk about renewing your mind when it comes to eating. I teach you about how short, what high fructose corn syrup does in your brain, how they use children as young as four in the Manel laboratories in the United States to do scientific studies and the parents are paid to bring their kids in and they fed this goo that is a, that is a literally the equivalent of like a sweet pink slime which you've heard about pink slime which is a reality which is in in um, basically any kind of take or take out meat if it's not pasture raised okay so they take they put these kids and they do what they call they give these children these 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 substances that are basically chemicals and and with different levels of high fructose corn syrup, which is already completely destroyed. It should not be separated. It's, it's a very dangerous substance. And they look for the children's bliss point. So they linked up to various different types of brain technology. And they look for what they call the bliss point. And the bliss point is where the child says, give me more, give me more, give me more. You know, when you eat, it's like you can't stop eating something. So what they have, they've, so these kids are being fed this and they work out. In other words, what I am telling you is that children are being used to design food that's going to destroy your brain. And it's legal. It's legal. There's no regulation on what they put in their whole design is to overcome your hormones, to overcome your, your, um, your, your brain has a natural, I'm full, I'm hungry um, balance, and that gets overcome and overridden. And this is through, so in other words, food is designed to confuse your brain, your hormones, and cause brain damage in your brain, your body. Now then you get, get like this, you're getting sick, and now we're saying the devil's attacking me. You ate the food. He didn't even have to do anything. What you have to do is create awareness. There is willful blindness is not a healthy thing. That's living like an atheistic Christian. You want an example of living like an atheistic Christian? You may not like what I'm saying. But if you're not aware of what's happening on this earth that God has given you in terms of the food that you put in your body, then you are living like an atheistic Christian. If you think it's okay to just carry on eating like that, that's your true, that's your choice. You're free to choose what you want to do. But don't then cry when you have a consequence you don't like. You see, it's a big deal to understand understand how what this is doing to our body so get the knowledge get the understanding and then in the last section I give you the beat it's how you're going to beat this how you're going to change your lifestyle how are you going to get your mind right to eat right etc 12 basic tips on how to do that and then there's a 63 day online program I walk you through daily with Bible studies you can do this in your churches I encourage churches to do this get your souls becoming students turn your gardens in, in your, your ground into edible gardens we have a, 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 a non-profit called the whole mind project and one of the first things that we do in the whole mind project is gardens we go to churches our daughters in Greece at the moment in an orphanage she was up in Seattle last week she runs our whole mind project where she's you can go and see on our if you follow whole mind project you'll see what she's doing and we are teaching kids to build gardens she was in a really destitute area in Seattle and those kids are those children in the school are learning to build have built gardens if she's actually built gardens that one garden will feed all those families in that church and the children are learning how to do that these this orphanage in Greece they will learn how to grow their own food so they're not you're not giving a child a fish you are teaching a child to fish if a child grows kale 
it'll eat and that child will not eat the child will eat the kale okay so they grow it they they eat it okay so there's a friend of ours called Ron Finley who's called the gangster gardener and Ron Finley is and he's, you can see him on, on TV he's actually going to be on my TV show in uh, next week and he had enough of sick people in his lives in uh, downtown Los Angeles which is a food desert a food desert is where you can only get takeouts which is cheap poison and they, they, they have a high, um, they have an inc a 65 percent higher rate of obesity, um, fatty liver disease, etc. In their area, and people on wheelchairs, people that are hugely overweight but completely starved. This is the first time in history people are obese and starving at the same time. And he had enough of this. People that have to live in a wheelchair because they can't move around because they're eating the wrong foods and they've become so unhealthy and they've got diabetes and etc. etc. And by the way, Alzheimer's is also called diabetes type 3, which is interesting because it's related to food. Okay, So when you're eating all that bad food, it is upsetting your colon and it's causing um, an excess of amyloid beta protein to go into your brain and cause brain damage. So food and thinking is a causing of causes of the dual causes of, of um, things like Alzheimer's and dementias. Anyway, Ron Finley had enough and he started planting gardens on the pavement and beautiful gardens with food and flowers in between and he got his neighborhood involved. He's now a global speaker. He's done a TED talk. I've also done a TED talk. You can see my TED talk as well on, on neuroplasticity of the brain, etc. And he has transformed na neighborhoods and now has a, has a global movement helping and encouraging people to grow gardens. When I see flowers it's beautiful but in amongst the flowers we should have edible landscapes and if you get your churches involved the people that can afford it can donate things you can get the people who can't afford it working in the gardens and the people who can afford it working in the gardens those that can pay for it pay for the vegetables and fruit those that can't they donate they donate they get it because they're working in the garden do you understand feed my sheep we're not just feeding spiritually. We have to stay alive. You see, you, you need God. And the second top addiction is you need food. You can't live without food. You cannot live without love. People die without love. People are designed to be loved and to live in acceptance and loving environments. People are having mental issues because of lack of correct love. The church should be pouring out true love and pouring out healthy food. Okay? And demonstrating mind stewardship. And it starts with a starts with one man. One man can make a difference. So in other words, you can make such a huge difference in, in people's lives as well. So I encourage you to get into that side. Now I was going to tell you that tomorrow night, so I told this back to front. But anyway, look at the next slide. And the next, it's not a problem because God knows what he's doing. So we'll tie everything up. So if you look at the next slide, you'll see that I'm going to show you, we're going to talk about the fact that we are thinking beings made in God's image. Okay? So this is kind of a recap of what I've been saying. And I'm going to tie in the food and all kinds of stuff into these things. So you're thinking being, you think, you choose, and you create intrinsically. So you are creative beings. You are always in a Genesis moment. You are using your free will six times every minute. Actually, on a conscious level, on a non-conscious level, 40 times a second. And deeper down in the depths of the non-conscious level at 400 billion actions per second. So you are choosing whether you like it or not. Dawkins, go to bed. Okay. <laughs> Time to stop talking for Dawkins, not me. Okay, so... We basically have this breakdown in our body. We all know we spirits our body. This is not new teaching. This is what you already know. So you're a spirit man, and that's the biggest part of you. That's that non-physical part. That, that's, nine, that's that 95 to 99 percent of you. So you are basically a spiritual being. And then you have a body. Let's talk about the body third, okay? The third part up there. Your body is obviously your brain and your body. The cells, the physical, okay? So when God made Adam, he took, obviously Adam was created as a spiritual being, however God did it, okay? We don't understand the timing we don't understand exactly everything but we do know that God made Adam as a spiritual being Adam and Eve as a spiritual being he then took the dust of the earth the carbon which can break etc the carbon hydrogen oxygen the basics of the earth and he basically formed the physical so out of the physical that God had created he then created a physical and that physical he added the spiritual to, and therefore you get spirit added to the physical and then you get soul soul is birthed as the spirit touches the physical so you your soul is your mind and your soul is birthed in the spirit of man and in and expressed through the physical of man. So our physical being is an expression of our spirit. So as we live our life we are expressing the spirit of God. We are reflecting his glory 
if we in that zone are you reflecting God's glory in your life by everything that you do on a moment by moment basis we've spoken about keep bringing all thoughts into captivity constantly all the time we've spoken a little bit about the food we've spoken about so we've spoken about the mind and the physical so we've done a little bit of talk about the brain and the body and the physical earth that that, that we live in and we've spoken a little bit about the fact that we need to bring all thoughts into captivity and that we have free will so in your mind which is your soul realm the mind and the soul are the same thing okay the mind when we talk about the mind we're talking about the soul of man okay that is your intellect you're intellectual you're brilliant you're outstanding how do I know that well I'm a scientist I've studied it for years I've studied intelligence theory and learning theory I've developed theories of learning and intelligence and how we think and you are brilliant so as a scientist I tell you you're brilliant I've seen it in the brain research but I know even more importantly that it says it in the Word of God that you are made in his image so therefore now another depth and another layer to being made in his image is that you are magnificent creatures creatures created in the image of this incredible God he, he's given you his intellect he he gave you free will he made you perfect and gave you the ability to choose and then advises you but if you choose right you will do well if you don't you'll choose wrong where do we see that multiple scriptures okay let's take Deuteronomy 30:19. I lay before you life and death blessing and cursing choose life so that you and your descendants may live wow generational impact we call that epigenetics in science so therefore the choices that you make are going to have a generational impact so that's not just the food choices you eat and research shows that what your great-grandfather ate has a, a who has played a role in your physical state as you are at the moment so you and your mother and your father not just and going back generations so your food choices of your great 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 grandfather affect your health now today your food choice in other words it's going through our generations but we have a neuroplastic brain neuro means brain plastic means to change so we can change our brain and our body how through our mind so now for a moment I want to come back to the second thing that happened 50 years ago so the first thing that happened 50 years ago was this whole food mess when food like products were created and I briefly introduce you to that and I've shown you how that if we with our mind choose to not think about this biological need of food we will get consumed and become mad modern American diet is the acronym is the mad diet modern American diet and the mad diet is very addictive and what research has shown us is that we are wired for love the top addiction is love I mentioned that already you cannot live without love you you are designed to be addicted to love ladies and gentlemen lo addiction is not a bad word addiction is an excellent word addiction means you designed to be consumed by something so God created us in his image with free will to choose to have a relationship with him and because he's love love is so natural to us it consumes us and that's what addiction means this desire to bring all thoughts into captivity to pray continuously to meditate on the word of God day and night to bring up your children etc etc to get knowledge get wisdom the word of God okay what it's teaching us what the word teaches us that is an addiction to God so if we don't have an addiction to God there's no gray zone you've got an addiction to the world and you're living like an atheistic Christian you cannot have a separation okay so then the second biological need is God designed you in a physical body with a brain and a body that needs food so he gives us the earth and the animals and and the intelligence to grow food and it's one of the first in first jobs that man has is to grow food and to nurture the animals and therefore we have to feed our bodies so it's addiction it, it is an addiction too you can't live without love you cannot live without food so when food becomes distorted it becomes mad modern American diet or sad is what's also acronym is also sad the sad mad and the sad mad I sound like that um, dr. Zeus at the moment and um, the sad mad diet will actually make you crazy because it is an addiction it is more addictive to have that donut than it is to have wait for it cocaine cocaine is on the seventh in a list of addictions number one is love number two is food number three and I've got the addiction somewhere over here but number seven is cocaine 
Heroin is number five. Psychotropic medication is number four. In other words, I will go so far as to say, when you have your donut walls at church, rather give your kids cocaine. It's safer. It's safer than that donut. Because it is, and who's going to go give their child cocaine? Well, then why are you giving them a donut? It's more addictive than the cocaine. So when kids get stuck and adults try and come off the modern American diet, they go through withdrawal. It's not a disease. It's bad food that's messed up your brain and your body so now when you come off it your brain and your body go through a period of restoration it has to regrow in the process of restoration your brain and your body will go through withdrawal symptoms so you get to go, to have, go through a bit of a hard time before the good time comes and then your body adjusts and it has to rewire and that's painful while you're going through it so when you talk about addiction we think of a heroin addict well let me tell you that that a hero, uh, the research shows that people that are addicted to things like cocaine and heroin they get out of it 86 to 93 percent get out of it how through choice it's more difficult to get out of eating the modern american diet than it is to give up heroin that is what the research shows. It's not what we told. We have been misled. You think, oh, heroin, bad person. Well, I say, hey, eating donuts, bad person. <laughs> bad choice. And that's a serious thing because it is destroying your brain insidiously. Whereas heroin knocks you out quickly. That donut over time and that food-like product over time is destroying your body. So you manifest with all kinds of mind and body issues. And then you get told you have a disease. And that you now need the second thing that was introduced 50 years ago. And that was psychotropic medications. Psychotropic medications are things like antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications, stimulants like Ritalin and Adderall, and, those ki and, and antipsychotics. So those are your basic categories. They say antidepressant, antipsychotic, as though they are like an antibiotic. So we know that an that a antibiotic actually does get rid of a biological organism that's destroying your body. So it is anti that, bi that, that, that the, the basic um, biology of that thing that's destroying your body. So that's the correct term. But to apply it to a depressant, so those medications that are supposedly fixing the depression and the psychoses and the schizophrenia and the ADD, and none of those are scientifically proven to exist. They are names for mind disorders. They are not diseases. So when we are told we have a disease of depression or a disease of bipolar or a disease of schizophrenia, there is no science to back that up. Harvard professors, Harvard, um, the top medical universities globally have stood up collectively and said this is not true. No decent scientist, and that includes doctors, will actually who have, have kept up to date with what is going on, will say that depression is a chemical imbalance that is absolute nonsense it's never been proven it was a theory that was promulgated there's no science to it they do not have a test that can test your your serotonin levels and your and your uh, dopamine levels it is a theory that is a really good money making theory yes when you use your mind wrong you will change your brain because as you are powerful you are having genesis moments you are thinking feeling and choosing and when you choose you cause genetic expression and when genetic expression happens you make stuff because genes produce things inside you you are alive because you are constantly expressing your genes that's the design of humans we have a genome and the genome basically makes us and keeps making us and we are always making ourselves and our mind is driving the process so every thought that you have is a genesis moment because you are actually creating some matter out of mind and it looks like a tree which is what I spoke about in the beginning so therefore in the beginning of your day you are creating what with the rest of your day because those things are part of you and then you speak from your words and your thoughts so whatever you are saying and whatever you are doing was first a thought that you built through your choices and if you stepped out of perfection and into imperfection if you stepped out of the perfect you into the imperfect you you've built a bad 
network. Therefore, I have this wiry looking tree to represent this symbolically. And we see in the brain when someone makes a wrong choice, it does upset the neurotransmitter balance. When you build, when you make a wrong choice, the gene expresses, but it expresses in a weird way. And the protein doesn't fold like it should. And the electromagnetic balance and the quantum balance and the neurotransmitters and everything at that point goes crazy. So we see changes in the brain. Since the middle of the 90s, we have the 1990s, we had the advent of brain technology, early 90s, so we could sort of see what's going on inside of the brain. And I say sort of see because you can't read thoughts. I, artificial intelligence and singularity will never, when they're trying to build a computer that's going to be like a brain, that doesn't never going to happen, okay? It's never going to happen. The scientist that's the leader in the world with this, 30 years ago, said he'll have it done in 10 years. 30 years later, he's only managed to map one circuit in a mouse brain. And he now, he now says singularity is crazy. Artificial intelligence is insane. We can't, the top scientists in the world, will, like, they, like they would tell you, you can't say that depression is a chemical imbalance because there's no scientific foundation. So you will find this top scientist in the world are saying, you cannot have singularity, you cannot have, which is artificial intelligence. We can keep on developing and build computers that are more intelligent, which is great, we need that, that's advance of technology, but they will never, it's a man who's built the computer, so the computer's never gonna out with the man. Maybe they can add faster and whatever because it's a machine. Okay, so, but it's not thinking, okay, and an and, and MRI machine can't read your thoughts. It says clearly in the Bible there are some limits, and some of those limits are only God and you know your thoughts. The diversity in the, of your mind is so vast that what those scientists have said, and this particular one who's the lead, world leader, comes from the same part of Africa, studied at the same university as I did, who's two years older than I am, and he runs the biggest, biggest brain research project globally and what he says after his first attempt 30 years ago when he said in 12 years I'll have AI built he says now 30 years later that it is impossible never in a thousand times a thousand years will we ever be able to replicate a thought because a thought is so completely and utterly organic and unique a thought that little mouse brain that one circuit that they've mapped is a veritable universe let me repeat that the one little mouse brain that they had the Bell Prize winning scientists and teams and billions of dollars it, to, it took to identify that single one unique little root in a mouse brain he said is a veritable universe and so he concludes if that is a veritable universe what is one thought in a human brain I want to know God's thoughts, the rest are details, is a quote that is actually Einstein said that. You know, and he said a lot of things about God, and yes, he used God metaphorically a lot, but how can you say and understand those things and not, he, when he won his Nobel Prize, they said, how did you do this? He said, I don't know, I looked up to the heavens and God showed me. So he would talk quite blithely about God, but what I'm saying to you is that God deposits in us, but we choose to respond or we choose not to respond. He's got it all out there. Sir Roger Penrose is a top mathematician, not a believer, but a, one of the top mathematicians currently of this age. And he's called Sir Roger Penrose. And he ha makes a comment that I find very interesting. He's involved in memory research as well. And, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the memory stuff tomorrow night as well. And he says that in the fabric of space-time, which is what Einstein discovered, that we live in this big, almost like a mollusk. You know what a mollusk is? This, that's what the space-time dimension is. He said that implanted in that are the value systems of consciousness. And what that fancy word means is that all the good stuff, all the God stuff is there, boom, and we access it. So he tries to get God out of the way by saying it's the value, but who put it there in the first place? Who put it there in the first place? So what we see is something very interesting happening, and that is that we have a powerful mind, but we have a development of thinking that's trying to control our powerful minds. Okay? And we know that that can only be driven by those that are fearful of the powerful mind, which is the enemy of God. Okay, the devil who is a defeated foe. So he has to use our intelligence and our power because he has none. But he can't use it because he doesn't have access to it. So how on earth does he use it? We give him permission. Okay, we choose to go down our own pathway. So if you are not guarding your mind in Christ Jesus and capturing every thought, guess who's influencing you? 
and you have the choice to listen or not because you create the reality. You listen, as you listen, the sound wave, the electromagnetic waves go in your brain, they set up an action in your brain, your eardrums are vibrating in sync with what you're listening to and you have this stuff firing through your brain. And now you make a choice, you think, you feel, you choose, you call genetic expression and you build either toxicity in your brain or health in your brain. Every wrong choice will result in proteins that fold incorrectly and networks that will form, which will then produce your words and your actions. And the more you think about them, science shows us that over 63 days, 21 times 3, we're going to learn this tomorrow night in detail, but it's in depth if you want to prepare for tomorrow night. It's in depth in this book, Switch on Your Brain, where I talk about the 21-day brain detox. I also have an online program that goes along with that. And I'll show you how we build trash into our unconscious mind or how we build life into our, an uncon on, into an unconscious mind, which becomes part of your belief system, which influences every decision that you make. So as you're in life, you've got stuff coming in, stuff coming up, and you make a choice. So coming back, and I'll end with this this evening, is coming back to that second thing that happened all those years ago, 50 years ago, more or less, was the introduction by mistake of psychotropic medication. And what they found was that a form of an anesthetic could actually, when they gave it in very low doses, seem to control people that were freaking out. I'm not denying that mental ill health exists. I'm not denying that people show symptoms of schizophrenia and symptoms of depression. I'm not denying any of those. But hear what I've said, symptoms of. They are symptoms. They are manifestations of something else that's going on. Some of those things can come from medications. There are terrible side effects of incorrect medication. And bad food full of chemicals will mess and can cause depression and things as well. So when you clean up your diet and you clean up and bring exercise into play, there's an amazing amount of mind stuff that will disappear in, from your life. But if you are... If you look at what happened 50 years ago, and it's a long story, and I'm going to give you the brief version of it, a medication was introduced that was actually not a medication, it was an anesthetic. And given in a very low dose, there was an experiment being done, given in a very low dose, it seemed to calm down people that seemed to be mentally ill. So the birth of, wow, we have a medication that can now potentially calm people's minds down. At that point in history, psychi psychi psychiatrists were considered to be crazy doctors, they weren't considered to be real doctors. They didn't have a very good name. They've over the ages they've been very um, in general. And I'm not, I have a lot of lot of friends who are psychiatrists that are believers that don't use medication. They do it the right way. So I'm not. I'm talking now in general, okay, about um, the tradition of the the tradition of and the history of psychiatry where they have a terrible history of experimenting on humans with terrible, terrible forms of literally torture and permissible. And in this country today, we still have it going on, where people can lose their rights to their children and themselves. We get terrible, terrible, heartbreaking stories and letters of, of people's children that have got caught up in the system and people that have got wives and husbands who've been caught up in a system where they've lost the right to their own life and to the life of their, to the control of their loved ones. And it's, it's, it's a scary thing. And they, and so in other words, a birth of movement was birthed 50 years ago, which a whole bunch of medications. By the 80s, 80s there was a ton of different medications. Prozac entered the scene in the mid 80s, and by and there's just been one after another of these medications, um, which are not medications. They are actually drugs. They are very addictive. They physically change the brain. They physically numb the brain. So the impression that some people get that they feel they calmer, that they feel they can cope better, is a um, is a temporary kind of band-aid. It's not dealing with the issue because very soon your brain will adapt because it grows things to actually adapt. Your brain responds to your thinking, it grows stuff. It responds to your eating, it grows stuff. It responds to good and bad eating by growing good and bad stuff. It responds to good and bad medication by growing stuff. So when your brain grows things to adapt, then once it's adapted, it will then start needing your, your symptoms will start coming back then you get told you've got another type or you need more medication or now suddenly you've got not only bipolar but you've now got or you started off with a mild depression now you're bipolar actually you're schizophrenic actually you need to be locked up and so it goes on and on and on now your libido is gone so you don't want sex anymore so now you're even more depressed and all kinds of stuff and now you're overweight and there's all these things and the side effects you know that there's 3,000 on average 3,000 side effects per drug and we're not told about those. And you just have to, in America and um, 
and in Australia they're allowed to advertise, and New Zealand, sorry, they're allowed to advertise directly, direct to consumer advertising, only to not in other countries in the world. So that's why you see on your TV, you see all these ads, but in the internet they can advertise anyway. So globally, people and kids are being advertised to, are being told, ask your doctor, doctors, and I have so many friends are doctors, and if anyone in here is a doctor, a medical doctor, I am not, I am not speaking against your skills because I have the best respect. I've done two years of medicine in the degree that I had to do, that I did, I had to do that. But doctors are not trained in the mind. Doctors are trained in the biology of the body and on the, and, and the, the physical systems of the body. Very few people have mind training and yet they are the first port of call. They are the people that are that we are going to, people that are going to, I've got depression, I'm going through this, etc., etc. What we have to be very careful of is medicalizing misery. That is a quote by a very famous um, psychiatrist who lectures at University College London. She's a top professor and she speaks against, as a psychiatrist, against medication. And she says that when society gets to the point where they start taking the normal things of life, like loss of a loved one, dealing with an issue, dealing with a mugging, dealing with a whatever, and you're now feeling upset about this, my goodness, you go to war, you're going to be upset. That's not a disease that you have. PTSD is not a disease. This is a real danger. This is something that has happened because you've been traumatized and we now need to love that person and where's the best place where's the best best place for healing the church because this is where we're supposed to espouse and reflect the love of God and reflect his glory but the church is on the same amount of medication as the world out there one in four people in this room are taking medications and I do not want you to feel guilty and I do not want you to go throw your medication down the toilet because your body has adapted and will go through withdrawal if you are in, if you are one of those people get knowledge okay get my books go online get with a doctor who will know understands how to help you withdraw safely change your food health habit, your exercise, do not just throw your medication away. Very, very dangerous. Okay? But you can withdraw. The good news is that research shows that you can withdraw. And when you withdraw, it takes around about 63 days and sometimes a few cycles. And there's going to be some tough days, like when you withdraw from the modern American diet. To encourage those of you that know someone who is on a medication, it's more difficult to withdraw from the modern American diet than it is from that, anti that antipsychotic or that antidepressant. Okay? Schizophrenia never used to be an issue like it is today. Now it's considered a lifelong disease. 50 years ago, not even 50 years ago, 30 years ago, it was, it was something that people would have a psychotic break, they would have a terrible situation happening in their life, they would, you go crazy, sometimes we freak out. But if we freak out in the love zone and we have a period of loving in the freaking out loving zone and we get loved by each other, guess what's going to happen? You're going to heal. And that's what was the treatment for schizophrenia. When people had a breakdown, we loved them back. We fed them healthy food. We loved them. We took them for walks. We had people with them 24-7. And that's what the church can provide. And that's another project we're setting up with our nonprofit is to teach churches how to get whole minds again. Whole minds, how we can form teams in our church. So these people, I can guarantee these people in this church that need that kind of support. And I can guarantee there's teams in this same church that can help each other. And research shows that if you're in a bad place, and I'm going to end with this, I'll never end. Um, when you're in a bad place, the quickest way of getting healed you will improve your own healing by 68% when you go help someone else. So if you needing help, become part of the team that is the help. And when we start loving each other back and stepping in our love, love zone, we are going to change the face of mental health. We don't want to give our children ADD medication. ADD, ADHD doesn't exist. In 1980, in the early 1980s, when I was finishing my first degree, we were the terms ADHD and ADD were introduced. And I'll never forget our very, very enlightened professor who said, this is a problem. They are going to, this, this Ritalin is a problem. Ritalin is speed. It's a drug that does the same thing as speed to the brain. It, uh, it causes the brain to shrink. It causes the child's hormones that don't work. They won't work properly, so they won't grow. It numbs them. It causes more problems. It does not heal ADD. ADD is not a disease. ADHD is not a disease. Learning disabilities exist. But people with learning disabilities, they have shown, have a higher IQ 
than other people. Now, when we talk about IQ, and this really is the last thing I'm going to tell you, IQ is, is a photograph in time, so it doesn't tell you your potential. So intelligence, you are as intelligent as you want to be. So when I say research shows they have a high, higher IQ, that does not mean that you don't have a good IQ and that someone else has it. It doesn't mean someone's better than you because no one compares to you. You're not in competition. You're as intelligent as you want to be. As you use your brain, you will heal your mind. You will increase your intelligence, but use your mind to make the right decisions, eat the right food, etc., etc. Let's help our kids. Giving Ritalin to kids is a child form of child abuse. I've got a whole TV show a whole series of TV shows coming up about this. Last thing, I promise you, really last thing, <laughs> is I have a TV show, um, as you know, season two I dealt with mental health. So what I've gone through at the speed of light tonight, there's a 12-part series on my TV show. You can pick it up on my webpage. So go to drleaf.com. I recommend you follow us because I've got, because you get two, three emails a week where I teach you stuff. I don't, and if you have got tons of material, none of my stuff's expensive. Obviously, all my stuff from my practice I've put into my materials because I can't teach you everything. But I have the TV show. It's free. I have YouTube videos. There's thousands of YouTube videos of me out there. You can get this information. But if you specifically want to know more about mental health, go and look at that. Go to my website. There's a whole resource for withdrawal, for med you know, understanding medications. There's a lot of stuff that I don't have time to get into. Maybe one day I'll come back and be able to do an eight-hour mental health workshop because that's how long it takes to teach it. So thank you very much. God bless you and I'll see you tomorrow night.